Hello, I'm Reed Blakemore, Associate Director at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. I'm here today with Amanda Lacaz, CEO of the Linus Corporation. Welcome. Amanda. Thank you. We're here today to talk about rare earth minerals. Mm -hmm. And w rare earths are an issue which is increasingly important in the news. They're a central part of the U.S.-China trade war, it seems. Uh, they're a growing part of the energy transition. It seems like the market is overall extraordinarily excited about these rare earths. Uh, recently, the United States recognized the importance of these rare earths and the fact that its dependence on these rare earths was so extreme it needed to uh, refocus itself on these issues and particularly refocus itself on the securing of ore bodies. In your opinion, is, is this the right approach? Is this the right way to go about doing things? Um, not completely. The rare earths market is quite a peculiar little market. Mm -hmm. It's, it's relatively small in value at a rare earth oxide level, mm -hmm. but it's enormous in value when you think about the finished goods that would not work mm -hmm. without rare earths as part of them. So as I look at the US um, and, and the policy considerations over the past, you know, sort of, probably a year or so that it's been being debated and of course it's been elevated in the in the just the last little while I, I and, and a lot of it is focused on finding the ore bodies because Rares is a great brand, you know, it's rare. Well, actually, <laughs> the elements are, are available um, uh, rather plentifully in the Earth's crust. They're just rare in deposits mm -hmm. which are economic to mine. Mm -hmm. Linus, we have what is generally recognised as the premier, uh, premier ore body in the world. Mm -hmm. It's in Mount World in Western Australia. It's out in the middle of nowhere. It's a collapsed volcano core that's 200 million years old. Mm -hmm. Our geologists get so excited about this as we go into this because it tells us what the Earth was like 200 million years ago, which is pretty, pretty cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. So um, we have in that even today, and we have more exploration and it's open at depth, we have more than 25 years mine life on that mine. Mm -hmm. um, and we can serve um, the US market very successfully. That is for the business of the, the, the resource itself mm -hmm. and indeed even the separation of those materials because the rare earths have been married for 200 million years mm -hmm. and the divorce is quite traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite difficult and, and so separating the materials. But that's not what ends up in your phone. Of course. Right, so it gets made into a metal and into a magnet and then into your, 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 your component making and then finally into the material that you see. And the risk for the US is not in access mm -hmm. to the separated rare earth oxide. Mm -hmm. The risk to the US is that there is no metal making and no magnet making. Mm -hmm. So there is this great chasm that needs to be jumped mm -hmm. from there to ensure that the component makers in the U.S. are protected. Mm -hmm. So you speak to you know, so many of the challenges the United States and for the most part other Western nations as mm -hmm. well uh, have, are confronting as it relates to the issue is that processing, is that kind of the suite of supply chain challenges associated with rare earth mining. Um, however, you look to a country like China Mm -hmm. that has had extraordinary success and actually has a dominant position in the market currently mm -hmm. as it relates to these rare earths. From your perspective, how has China been able to get to where it has gotten in this position? And what should, what should Western countries be doing? What other models are out there that are actually working and succeeding? So, so China, China's journey in rare earths really started uh, nearly 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and Deng Xiaoping very famously said, the Middle East has oil, China has rare mm -hmm. earths. And what they said was instead of, and sometimes in Australia we have this situation where we don't want to be the farm and the quarry of the world, you know, dig up our resource but send it somewhere else to have, mm -hmm. it, have it value added. And what the Chinese decided to do was, we've got the resource, we're actually going to do the value adding ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that they've been able to develop technology 
but most importantly in China they've been able to provide employment mm. in the downstream areas which are the much higher employing areas than for example mining. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't actually employ a lot of people in mining itself. But I can tell you, if you go and have a look at a, a magnet production line, mm -hmm. there are a lot of bodies on that line actually working. Mm -hmm. And so China has progressively moved through this. And indeed, with a very clear strategic plan, which has been executed excellently, mm -hmm. um, has said to Western manufacturing companies, if you want our rare earths, you put your production facilities here in China. Mm -hmm. And so by doing so, you know, a company that might be a large electronics company will put its manufacturing in China. Mm -hmm. China gets the benefit of that and then the finished product is re-exported mm -hmm. to the West. So this has been really deliberate and I think it's been executed excellently and I think the, the, the Chinese, the various Chinese governments mm -hmm. deserve recognition for that. The last time that rare earths were really sexy, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's sort of hard to think about <laughs> rare earths being sexy, but the last time they were, they were like really sexy was in 2010-11 mm -hmm. when once again China used the rare earths weapon in a diplomatic spat they were having with Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole world then thought, oh gosh, we'd better think about rare earths. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting, the responses. So in Europe, they set up some um, uh, study institutes mm -hmm. to understand rare earth supply chains. In the US, you launched a WTO case mm -hmm. Uh, in Japan, where the automotive industry, which you cannot have without rare earths, mm -hmm. is essential, they said, hmm, we're going to fund Linus. Yep. Right. The result is that the Japanese market has reliable and secure supply of rare earths, mm -hmm. and the Japanese market since 2012 the rare earths processing industry, value adding industry, magnet making industry has grown by 60%. Wow. So I guess then that sets us up well for what, looking ahead, you know, what sort of, what, what role does Linus have to play in as these challenges increase in importance and what partnerships uh, is Linus going to be looking at? You, you know, just had some very, very positive news uh, about your efforts in Malaysia. You just had this fantastic MOU announcement with Blue Line based out of Texas mm -hmm. in the United States, which is huge for the United States in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of, how are, is what sort of models and partnerships are going to become the norm uh, in helping resolve these challenges? And where do you see Linus going in that? So where are we going? So we're in a, uh, we're in a really good position mm -hmm. today um, and we have significant benefit from first mover advantage, which is so, sort of sounds funny in a market that's been around for a few decades, mm -hmm. but non nonetheless we have that. And I sort of talk about this and I say, well, you know, we have this true tier one resource. The mm -hmm. definition of that is high grade, long life. Yep. It's a gift of nature, mm -hmm. right? We have a first mover advantage mm -hmm. in the market, so we're there for, that's a gift of time. Mm -hmm. But we also have a unique intellectual property. Mm -hmm. That's a result of our hard work. Mm -hmm. And that is the platform on which we will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. So we are currently running our facilities at about 140% of their original design rate. We did a small upgrade last year we called Linus Next, but it gave us about 40% extra capacity. We've just announced a plan, we've called it Linus 2025, mm -hmm. and we will increase our throughput again by another 50%. Mm -hmm. And that means that we can serve the outside China markets. Mm -hmm even as they grow over the next five years. Mm -hmm. um, what we're looking to do is to have a more diversified industrial footprint. Mm -hmm. So we will be doing more processing in Australia and the Australian government is very keen on us doing that. 
we will, we will do further investment in our plant in Malaysia, particularly in value-added materials, but we do want to establish an industrial footprint here in the US. And the first step of that was the announcement of the joint venture with Blue Line. Um, we are looking very clearly to engage with the government on policy matters and otherwise to ensure that we can have policy settings, infrastructure, um, uh, supply chain management in a way that actually meets the need of needs of U.S. industry. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds all fantastic. And we appreciate having you here and hope the Atlantic Council can continue to be a resource as we begin studying these issues and as these issues only continue to grow more in importance as the United States explores its role uh, in the critical mineral space. Thank you, Amanda. It was wonderful to have you and we look forward to having you again soon. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thank you.